welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. Back in 2010, I published this book, A Brief Guide to Cloud Computing, and I also uploaded several cloud computing videos. Since that time, cloud computing has become a mainstream, if sometimes controversial, activity, and so in this video I thought I'd explore where cloud computing is today, with a particular focus on its drivers and risks. Cloud computing delivers software applications, data storage, processing power, or other computing resources over the internet. Before cloud computing, the end-user computers in most companies access information and applications from a local server or data center. But under the cloud computing model, a company's own internal infrastructure is replaced with cloud services. And if you're wondering why it's called cloud computing, it's because the internet has traditionally been illustrated on a network diagram by a cloud symbol. Cloud computing has three key characteristics. Firstly, it's an on-demand service that a customer can purchase as their needs dictate. Secondly, cloud computing is elastic as the customer can increase or decrease the quantity of computing resources they require on a very rapid basis. And finally, cloud computing is device independent as cloud services can be accessed on any computer with an internet connection. Gartner predict that the cloud services marketplace will be worth 206.2 billion in 2019 and will grow to 278.3 billion in 2021. IDC predict a similar market size of 210 billion in 2019, rising to 370 billion in 2022. Ten years ago, many people claimed that cloud computing was a fad that would never catch on. But today, there can be no doubt that cloud computing is a very significant and growing computing trend. Cloud computing has three key service models known as SaaS, PaaS and IaaS. SaaS, or Software as a Service, refers to the delivery of pre-existing software applications over the internet. So, rather than having an app installed on your local computer, you run it from the cloud. SaaS applications include the Microsoft Office 365 web apps, CRM software from Salesforce, ERP applications from NetSuite, and the Google Docs word processor. Back in 2010, I wrote my cloud computing book in Google Docs, and nearly a decade later, the files are just as I left them. It also gives me a lot of confidence to know that I can return to an old cloud document very easily, indeed. PaaS, or Platform as a Service, provides online resources for creating and delivering custom SaaS applications. This allows companies to create their own cloud software, so allowing them to obtain the benefits of SaaS while maintaining the ability to run bespoke programs. Popular PaaS offerings include the Salesforce platform, Microsoft's Azure, and Google App Engine. Finally, IaaS, or Infrastructure as a Service, provides online server capacity that customers can use as they require. So, for example, IaaS allows existing applications to be migrated from a local data center to a cloud facility, rather than requiring new applications to be built on the cloud vendor's platform. Major IaaS providers include IBM, Microsoft, Alibaba, and Amazon Web Services. As mentioned earlier, a key characteristic of cloud computing is the provision of an on-demand pay-as-you-go service, and the pricing guide for Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, shows explicitly how this works. As we can see, EC2 users can choose the specification and number of virtual servers or instances that they require, with the price per hour measured in cents. A decade ago, I argued that companies needed to embrace cloud computing in order to reduce cost, to lower their carbon footprint, and to gain access to next-generation computing services. Now, 
Across the past 10 years, the first of those cost reduction has been the big driver of cloud adoption, with very few companies internally able to run basic computing services such as email as cost effectively as large cloud providers like Microsoft or Google. Now, the reason that cloud providers can provide very cost effective services is partially about economies of scale, but it's also because they can run the servers of their data centers at an optimum level of utilization, maybe at about 80%. Whereas in internal data centers in most companies, servers on average would run at a much lower level of utilization. I've known internal data centers where servers run at about, say, 25% utilization most of the time. And that means that the cost of each unit of computing power from an internal data center like that is going to be much higher than it is in the cloud computing data center where there's an optimum level of server utilization. This optimum server utilization issue also means that local data centers typically have higher greenhouse gas emissions per unit of computing power delivered than those of cloud vendors. So, companies that want or need to reduce their carbon footprint have a second good reason to migrate to the cloud. Now, while cloud computing can offer powerful cost reduction and environmental benefits, today and going forward, I would argue that the key driver of cloud computing will be gaining access to next generation computing services. 10 years ago, cloud computing was the disruptive computing trend. But increasingly, it will be the delivery platform for many other forms of digital transformation, a subject I've covered previously in my Drivers of Digital Transformation video. Specifically today, I would highlight two key developments, two key computing trends that will catalyze our future use of the cloud. The first of these is the rise of cloud AI services, or AI, AAS, Artificial Intelligence as a Service, with Google and Microsoft and IBM and Alibaba and others now turning AI into a cloud-based commodity service. Already, Cloud AI services allow any company or any body to plug AI into their products or web services without having to invest in significant AI expertise or infrastructure. With the arrival of 5G mobile networks, Cloud AI is also set to morph into cloud robotics or robotics as a service, with many future smart machines to be controlled, at least in part, by AI services delivered over the internet. Looking further ahead, an associated frontier will be cloud-based quantum computing or quantum computing as a service. This will provide online access to quantum computers that will excel at simulations, optimizations, and the hosting of potentially new forms of artificial intelligence. Already, both IBM and Alibaba provide cloud access to functional, if experimental, quantum computers. So, Quantum computing as a service is already a reality, and you can learn more about it in my quantum computing videos. Our mass migration to the cloud is, of course, not without its risks, and most commonly, people raise security concerns. This said, across the past 10 years, most major online security breaches have involved in-house IT services, not the services of major cloud vendors like Microsoft or Google or IBM or Amazon or all the others, because of course they've got a great incentive to keep their systems secure. And indeed I've heard it argued that companies can increase the level of IT security by migrating to the cloud. To give an example of that, a few months ago I gave a talk on the future of computing at the University of Manchester and there were two other speakers on the agenda, and they were both from the IT department of very large companies. And both of those companies had migrated a lot of their IT to the cloud. One had gone with Microsoft, one had gone with uh, Amazon. They argued about which one was right in terms of their decision. But they both also argued that they'd gone to the cloud partially because of cost and partially because of security. And the argument was that when vulnerabilities are discovered in computer hardware and in software, they are reported to and fixed by the large computing companies, who are also the large cloud vendors, long before they're reported to everybody else to fix in their data centers. So their argument is if you want to have the best patched servers, those servers have to be located in the cloud vendor's data center rather than the local data center.
Personally, I think the biggest danger of cloud computing is not security, but the risk would become too dependent on the internet and on a small number of global computing companies. I also worry greatly that we are becoming too reliant in that context on the licensing model, on the rental model, rather than ownership. For example, as you may know, in April 2019, Microsoft has announced it is closing the ebook section of its online store, which means that fairly soon, if you've bought a book from the Microsoft ebook store, you won't have the book. You won't be able to read the book. It will have gone. And they might give you some compensation, but you haven't got the book. And as someone who uh, rather cares about books, I do worry that we're going too far in that direction. I think cloud computing is great in terms of reducing cost in businesses, in having environmental benefits, in offering all kinds of new services. But we must maintain some link to a, you know, physical things, physical reality. And the risk of cloud computing is we lose sight of that. Cloud computing is already helping us to communicate and collaborate in new ways. Cloud services are also allowing both individuals and small companies to gain access to the kinds of computing provision only previously available to large companies, and that has to be a good thing. Within 10 years, artificial intelligence as a service and quantum computing as a service may also be entering the mainstream, something I discussed in my latest book, Digital. Genesis. Links to all of the different things mentioned in this video are down in the video description. Lots of links down there for everything in this video. But now it is it for this video. If you've enjoyed what you see here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.